with Julia and Heaven um, here at the Institute of Public Health Innovation and the Prince George's uh, Food Equity Council as a program assistant. Um, my favorite ice cream, I have two. I tend to always go like coconut flavor and then strawberry, <laughs> but it has to be also chunky like when they put the strawberries in there, like kind of frozen. So those two. <laughs> Thanks, Scarlett. Taran, do you want to go next? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Taran Shaw, Program Coordinator with Adventist Healthcare and Co-Chair of the FEC. My favorite ice cream flavor has to be grape nut. All right, I see Casey. Hey, thanks, Taran. I'm Casey Dyson with Food and Friends. Uh, we deliver medically tailored meals in the region. Prince George's County is about 30% of our total work. Uh, favorite flavor is pistachio. And let's see, who's next? Uh, Kim, you're next on my screen. Kim Rush. Hey everyone, sorry I'm in transition here at the moment. Um, I'm Kim Rush Lynch, I'm the Urban Ag Conservation program manager and planner for the Prince George's Soil Conservation District. I work a lot with urban farmers and I'm one of the founding members of the Food Equity Council. And in terms of my favorite ice cream flavor, lately I've been um, hitting up Simple Pleasures Honey Lavender. It's really good. Or vanilla honey lavender, yeah. So I can't see people, but I think I heard Harrison on here earlier. So I'm gonna pop it over to Harrison. Thank you, Kim. Hey, everyone. I'm Harrison Palmer. I'm the vice president of the Prince George's County Farm Bureau, and I work with the Prince George's Soil Conservation District. Uh, my favorite ice cream undoubtedly is peach, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Chloe. Thanks, Harrison. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Chloe. I <clears throat> um, work at Friends of the Earth, and I am another co-chair with Turin of the Prince George's County Food Equity Council. Um, sorry for being off camera today, and I'm also gonna have to jump early. I just landed in LA and I'm gonna head off to the desert in a minute here. Um, so I will be desperately in need of ice cream as I believe the high is 109 today. And I um, I think I'm gonna have to double up on the strawberry with, with Scarlett. And I'll pass it over to Bridget. Hi all, my name is Bridget Warren, Program Manager for the Prince George's County Office of Food Security, and I'm just basic chocolate, preferably dark chocolate. And I'll send it to my colleague, Kyra. Who I think I saw on here? Maybe not. Okay, Jamie. Thank you, Bridget. My mother would love you because she is a dark chocolate fan. <laughs> Happy hot July, everybody. I'm Jamie Austin from Prince George's County Public Schools, where I serve in the area of energy and utilities. And uh, my favorite ice cream, wow, it's tough. Um, it could be heaven, cookies and cream. And on occasion, um, Harrison, it could be peach. If it's Chick-fil-A's pe pe peach milkshake, or if I'm down south, I will get a blueberry milkshake from, I forget the name of the place, but maybe I'll remember it later, but it's nothing, it's really great. <laughs> Thank you. Who am I going to pass it to? I will pass it to Dorothy. Hello, everyone. My name is Dorothy Price, and my favorite ice cream is butter pecan. I love it. Uh, and I'm from Shabak Emergency Resource Center. And I'm passing it on to the very next person. And by the way, we don't have any internet, so I'm standing outside so I can stay on. <laughs> Must be near a solar panel. <laughs> yes, right, right. Okay, who hasn't gone yet? Monique, maybe? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Monique Kaiser. Um, like you said, it's going to be difficult. I like any kind of ice cream that either has espresso in it or caramel in it, in those combinations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see who hasn't gone yet. Diana? Okay. Hi guys. Uh, yeah, so my name is Diana Torres. Um, I am simply um, a, an interested, concerned uh, resident of Prince George's County um, looking to uh, find ways to help improve um, food equity in the county. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Evelyn, have you gone yet? Okay, let's go to you and then keep popcorning it around. Hi guys, my name is Evelyn Batista and I am program assistant for Flavors leading the Magnolia University and we are in PG County. And I'll pass it over to Samia. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Samia Bingham, founder and CEO of Flavors. We are the shared culinary commercial kitchen um, space that is also launching the new education platform in just a few weeks. Um, and I'm an ice cream girl, so mint chocolate chip is my jam. Thanks, Samia. Let's see, Tristan. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Tristan Nichols. I'm the operational manager of Flavors. In other words, we are an incubator kitchen that helps build companies. And my favorite ice cream is lavender, lavender blossom. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, Jocelyn. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Rodriguez, and I'm the founder and CEO of Coaching Saludolistica. Um, we work a lot with uh, PGCPS, and I would say my favorite ice cream is anything like Oreos, cookies and cream, all that chocolatey um, type of flavor. So yeah, I will say that that's something that I actually had earlier today. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Megan. Hey everyone, um, my name is Megan Todd. I'm a senior legal specialist with the Agricultural Law Education Initiative um, based at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. I think the question is what our favorite flavor of ice cream is. And I think what I like to go for is actually like vanilla with whipped cream and hot fudge mixed in. Sounds good. Sophia, have you gone yet? Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm the new VISTA um, member at University of Maryland. I'm working with their campus pantry and their community learning garden and the turf farm. And my favorite ice cream flavor is probably mint chip. Fatima? Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima Hassan. I'm with the Prince George's County Planning Department. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance. And my favorite ice cream is Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. And so I can't see who else I need to pass it to, but. That's okay. I'll pass it to David. Hi, everybody. Um, wait, let me put my camera on. Okay. Hi. Um, I, uh, let's see, favorite ice cream flavor. Uh, that's hard. Um, <laughs> I know I've been listening to all y'all say all these great ones and I'm like, geez, that's hard. Um, I'm going to go with um, blackberry. I had that like recently and I was just had my, it rocked my world. Um, so I am a PG County resident. I'm a graduate student about to be finished with my Master of Public Health from George Washington University in Public Health Nutrition. Um, and I am working with Maryland Hunger Solutions and uh, Johns Hopkins University on a project. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to um, Dorbor, who is my colleague. Hi, um, sorry for joining late. Um, what was the prompt for introductions? Your favorite ice cream flavor. It's a tough one. Okay. Um, so my all-time favorite has been 
my all-time favorite has been Mitch Mar- but I just got into Jenny's ice cream and I love their Bramble Berry Crisp ice cream. Um, and my name is Dorber. I'm now a second year student, master's student at Johns Hopkins, um, studying population, family, and reproductive health. And Great. thanks for being here. I will pass it off to Rashita. Uh, hello, I'm Rishita. I'm a second year student at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, so MSPH program. And um, yeah, that's all. Okay, anyone else who hasn't gone yet? I know we're missing a few people, but I'm having a hard time keeping it all straight. My brain is clogged. Hey, Tayana. Hi, my name is Tayana Harrison. I am a co-founder of an early stage startup called Home Cook, where we connect food entrepreneurs to commercial kitchen rentals. Nice to see you, Samir, a long time. Um, and my favorite ice cream, I would say, it is a really hard question, but I'll stick to like my favorite as a child, which was like the sherbet ice cream. Thanks so much. Anyone else? I think Mara. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Mara Russell. I'm the owner operator of Ad Astra Farms. I serve Prince George's and Charles Counties. Um, and Food Rescue has been my entry point to uh, the Food Equity Council. And my favorite ice cream flavor, I'm going to cheat and say it's a tie between vanilla bean and green tea. Yummy. I think that's the most creative answer I've heard. Um, Jessica, have you gone yet? Okay, if anyone hasn't gone yet, chime in now. And if not, we'll just keep on moving. And if you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself, you can always use the chat. My name is Dr. Rhonda, Holy Mountain International Ministries, uh, Director of Outreach. And your question was, what was our favorite ice cream? I like anything that's vanilla based. I don't like plain, so if it's like, Plain vanilla, French vanilla, maybe if it has butter pecan or something like that, then um, that's what I like. Sounds good. Good to have you here. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you for indulging me in this. Um, this was fun. I feel inspired to go out and get some new ice cream flavors. Um, and so we'll we'll keep on rolling with our agenda. Um, I think it's really nice when we are able to kind of get to know each other a little bit more and um, and hear who we are and, and where everyone works and, and what they're up to. Um, so let me just pull up my agenda again. Okay, can everyone see this still? Um, so we always... Um, like to kick off after our um, introductions, um, we just like to point everyone to our foundational principles and goals, which is always linked at the top of our agenda. Um, so if you are not familiar with these, I would encourage you to take a look. Um, I'm not going to read through all of them right now, um, but please, please, please do look at these. Um, if you are not familiar, it really kind of grounds us and helps us understand the work that we do together um, and gets us all on the same page. Um, because, you know, it really is, these, these foundational principles and goals are really embedded in all of the work that we do throughout um, our different projects and our different committees. Um, so this is here, this is linked in the agenda. Um, and if you haven't, haven't already gotten to this, um, if you could just directly link this in the agenda for it, in the chat for me, that would be great. So I'm going to jump back to um, our agenda. Um, we also always link our past meeting notes. So if you weren't able to make the April meeting, um, please check that out. Um, we heard some updates on organizational developments as well as updates from our committees. So the notes and the recording is also linked here. Any questions before I continue moving? Yes. Okay. And if you're not talking, please do mute yourself um, so we can be sure to hear all of our speakers. Um, so I'm going to run into run through some quick um, organizational updates from the FEC. Um, and then we're going to hear from Dorbor and David, who introduced themselves um, earlier. 
um, about some of their research they're working on. We're going to hear from Samia and Evelyn from Flavors. Um, and then we're going to have a brainstorm discussion about how we can celebrate the Food Equity Council's 10 year anniversary. Um, so kind of mull that over until we get to it. Um, we're hoping to hear from you all about your creative ideas. Um, then we'll have some committee updates um, from any of our committee leaders who are able to, to join us today. Um, and then um, we'll have some brief member announcements um, and run through some resources and we'll close it out. Um, I think we'll probably finish up in less than two hours, but we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm sure everyone wants to get to your, your summer afternoon and evening. Um, so with that, um, just quick staffing updates. Um, we shared this at the past FEC meeting, um, but as you guys know, a lot of you probably know, um, our director, Sydney Daigle, stepped down from her position, um, feels like forever ago. Um, I think it was in March, but if my memory serves correct, um, she's still working with us, um, doing some light consulting. So she's not entirely gone, but she moved to the UK with her family. We're very excited for, for her move. Um, but we are now looking for a new Food Equity Council director um, to take that position. We launched into um, a search process um, earlier this spring. Um, unfortunately, none of the candidates panned out. Um, so we are kind of going back to the drawing board, looking at folks that had previously applied and seeing if any of them might be a good candidate. So we're currently working on that with our HR team. Um, and we will kind of see how that goes. Potentially, we'll need to relaunch um, this the position opening, um, but we'll kind of make that decision once we're able to kind of sift through some of those existing applications that, that we currently have. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have any big updates to share on that front, um, but hopefully by the October meeting, we'll have some more information for all of you. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Okay, um, just financial updates. Um, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty details of all of the Food Equity Council's kind of finances and different grants and funding. Um, but, you know, I think it's it's always nice to share um, that if anyone wants any more information on where we have get our funding, um, what sorts of funding pots that support our work, I'm always happy to share more information. Um, the one thing I did wanna share is that the Food Equity Council has continued to receive um, funding from the county, um, from the county's non-departmental grants. Um, so we have funding for, for this year, and then we've also recently applied to the FY24 um, funding. Um, so we're still waiting to hear back about how much we're going to get from them, um, but that is in the works. That's a process that happens every year, and they've continued to, to support our work along with many other funders. So we really do have kind of a blend of funding that supports all of our, our projects um, and our staff team at the Food Equity Council. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Heaven to share some advocacy updates. Hi all. Um, yep, I just wanted to share a little bit about the healthy restaurant bill. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the news, um, but we successfully supported the passage of um, the Healthy Restaurant Bill um, that establishes a voluntary healthy restaurant program in the county. Um, and restaurants that participate in this program receive marketing and support from county agencies. So it's a great step in the right direction. We're excited um, to see this hopefully pan out in, in the coming years. Um, and I also wanted to share a, a little bit about the county budget. Um, so the FEC testified, uh, it, I don't honestly remember what, when that was, but um, I also want to sh share like a thank you to everyone who participated in the county budget hearings um, and what we asked for um, during these um, budget hearings. So we asked for financial inf and infrastructure support for food pantries and other food assistance providers. We asked for funding for the programs and positions recommended by the Prince George's County Council Food Security Task Force and continued funding for the county's Maryland Market Money Program. So thank you all who, um, who participated in the county budget hearings and um, testified. Um, and I will pass it back to Julia. Thanks, Heaven. Um, I'll just echo that. Um, it's it's so important that our FEC members participate in this and 
your voice really does matter when it comes to our advocacy work. Um, so we are always eager and excited to, to have you join us, um, whether it's testifying in person, whether it's submitting you know, written comments. Um, so the door is always open for your involvement. And if you are new to testifying, if you've never done it before, if you want more information, please always feel free to reach out. Um, we're always happy to walk you through it, walk you through the process um, to make sure you feel comfortable um, testifying and, and sharing your, your thoughts and your opinion on, on whatever issue that, that we're advocating for. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Um, so our next item on the agenda is we're gonna ha have, um, here are some, some updates and some information from Dorbor and David who introduced themselves previously. Um, on some of the research they're doing um, on direct certification through Medicaid um, in partnership with Maryland Hunger Solutions. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn a little bit more about what they're doing and hopefully um, provide input and, and chime in um, as needed. So I'm gonna pass it over to you guys and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in case you have any slides or anything you wanna share or feel free to just share verbally. Okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna see if I can uh, pull those up. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, thanks very much for having us. So, uh, my name is David Noto. Um, my colleague is, uh, Dorbor Tarley, and we will be briefly, uh, telling you all about a research project that is happening um, on direct the impact of direct certification through Medicaid on uh, Maryland community school participation. So um, to start with, we are looking at um, summer meal site uh, service. So the summer food service program provides free uh, meals and snacks to uh, school children in low-income communities. Most of these meal sites are providing um, other activities beyond just uh, providing food. So um, oftentimes it's at schools. It's not always at schools. Um, there can also be at um, churches or at community centers or at parks. Um, and so the way the system is set up is that the summer food service program at the federal level provides uh, money to MSDE, who in turn provide it to sponsors. That can either be school districts, for, so PGCPS, um, or nonprofit organizations. Um, the Capital Area Food Bank is um, one of the biggest ones in um, PG uh, beyond PGCPS. And so you can see that that can be different um, sites such as parks or libraries, um, or schools. Um, so during the pandemic, um, waivers allowed for greater flexibility, and that meant that um, food could be picked up there and then taken home, and that parents and guardians could also um, pick up the, the food. It didn't have to just go to, straight to the kids. Um, and so this allowed for much greater uh, simplicity and much greater um, ease of access to the food. So this is just a graph to show you how much summer meals um, increased between 2019 and 2020. And that's all due to the pandemic. Um, so almost 10 million served in 2020. That's a incredible amount. And you can see here um, the meal sites during 2019. Um, and then so there were not only significantly more meal sites in 2020, but they, um, they serve significantly, 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 hard word to say, greater population uh, during the pandemic as well. So um, just again, to continue with giving you all some background, the community eligibility provision um, is part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, and it allowed um, certain 
schools and uh, local education agencies to provide breakfast um, and lunch free of charge to all of the students at that particular school, um, regardless of whether they qualify for free and reduced meals. Um, if what's known as the um, identified student percentage or ISP um, of students who participate in programs like SNAP um, or WIC or TANF is greater than 40% of the student uh, body at a particular school or um, local education agency. So currently, right now, um, all of Dorchester County, Wacomico County, and Somerset County, and all of Baltimore City um, get universal free meals thanks to the community eligibility provision. That started back in 2016, I believe. And when that happened, um, Dr. Susan Gross, who's the uh, lead researcher of the project that we are um, a part of, and at, from Johns Hopkins and folks from Maryland Hunger Solutions did a study, an impact evaluation study of um, the impact that this had on school children in Baltimore City and found that food, child food insecurity dropped by over 30%, which is just ridiculous that it would have that much of an impact. So in for PGCPS, uh, 20 schools are participating and another 15 are uh, eligible but haven't participated yet. Um, and we'll get into uh, why they may they aren't necessarily participating at the end if you all have questions. So what we are looking at in this project, which is sort of a follow-up to the previous um, impact evaluation study, is that during uh, this past school year, Maryland will expand um, the community eligibility provision using direct certification through Medicaid. Um, this would allow families who are enrolled in Medicaid to be automatically eligible, and this would increase the overall percentage of students enrolled and thus expand the number of schools eligible for um, universal coverage through the community eligibility provision. It's also going to expand um, eligibility of summer meals and increase um, areas where they could receive them. So um, we're going to be, we've already started doing um, interviews of stakeholders um, and are trying to assess the impact of direct certification through Medicaid on meal participation in community schools in particular. Um, and so we're looking to get some of the socio uh, demographic breakdown of households utilizing these different programs um, and whether or not that changes between schools that are already participating in the community eligibility provision, schools that will now be eligible for the community eligibility for coverage, or schools that are choosing not to and why they're not choosing to do so. Um, so the big research question for us is what are the characteristics of households utilizing summer meal programs from community schools before and after implementation of direct certification through Medicaid? And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dorbor, um, who will tell you about our methods. Um, hello. Okay, thank you, David. Um... Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the methods now. I realize I don't Can you go to the next slide? Right, thank you. Um, so we have three data collection methods. Um, the first is an online survey. So the households who participate in the summer meals in PG County, um, we're hoping to get 500 um, families to participate. And then we have food access and food assistance and food security. And that's what we're looking at. And we're also looking at diet quality. And then for meal participation, um, school and summer meals served in um, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. Um, we have Maryland SFSP sponsors. So there's about 43 that we're looking at. 
Um, and then we have the Maryland FNS public school authorities as well. And then as within our focus on meal participation, we're looking at community school meal participation and um, um, the Mar through the Maryland State Department of Education. And then for in-depth interviews, um, we're going to be focused on food um, service directors, F F S F as P sponsors and stakeholders. So we're hoping to get um, about 13. And then um, we're interviewing them about their experiences with direct certification through Medicaid on school meal participation. And so our progress up to date is um, we've completed 12 in-depth interviews with FNS directors, and we begin data, data collection at three summer meal sites in Prince George County Schools. Um, and we have obtained summer meal participation data for summer 2022. And how we hope you guys can be involved is, um, so we're targeting back to school events and any other events that parents will be at between now and September um, and to act as an intermediary um, to get approval from principals and as well as circulating flyers that we have. We have a Spanish survey and an English survey and we have flyers that correlate with that um, with QR codes that has linked to the survey. And our survey is taken on REDCap by participants and takes them to a Qualtrics link where they were given a $10 gift card for completing our survey and also providing volunteers to help with two main back to school events we have confirmed so far um, and donate supplies for back to school events because one of the schools that we're gonna be at requires a giveaway in order to be at their back to school event. And for acknowledgements, um, at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health, I would like to acknowledge our head researcher, um, Suzanne Gross, then Aaron Hager, Samantha, Rashida, and then at Maryland Hunger Solutions. I'd like to acknowledge Michael, Julia, and Sonia. And if there are any questions, we do have an email account, um, and we can also take questions now as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dorbor and David. Do folks have questions? If um, we were interested in which schools participate in the program and which ones do not, do you have a list that you would be at liberty to share? Ooh. It's a good question. So all of the schools that we are working with are community schools. Um, and so uh, we were hoping originally to look at 11 different schools. I think we've actually gotten um, uh, principal um, approval at only five um, at the moment. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we're getting them from all different parts of the county. So um, we have schools in, let's see, Greenbelt, Capitol Heights, um, Cheverly. Um, it's a fairly broad range. They're all elementary schools also. I don't know if I can um, share with you the, the 11 uh, schools just right off the bat, but um, if you'd like, I can uh, give you more details later on, or if you want to um, shoot us an email, um, we can uh, touch base that way. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. D David or Dorborg, can you share, have you experienced, I guess, is is there hesitation on kind of the principal's behalf in terms of kind of bringing you guys in and, and kind of what does that look like? Uh, Dorbor, if you want to share about what happened um, last week. <laughs> yeah, um, last week we had, we've been in contact with this one school since, I guess, uh, I started in end of May, so I've been in contact with them end of May, but David has been in contact with the schools a lot longer than I have been, um, and we finally were able to get the principal to sign off on the approval form for the school. And I sent them an email the day before, just letting them know that we're coming in and like, this is what we're doing. This is how many people we're coming with. Um, and we just hope to set up um, as agreed by the principal permissions form. And we get there and we're just like, um, we were met with the principal just stating that they don't have summer meals. Um, and that I guess they've been 
ignoring our calls or like trying to say no, but not directly saying no. Um, but they signed the permission form. So we were under the impression that because they signed the permission form that they did have a, they were a summer meal site. They did have students there and they would have parents dropping off um, the students, but they did not. So we had to like go in the parking lot and like re group and figure out how to not waste a day because we all did come out from Baltimore. Um, so yeah, we were able to get in contact with another principal who were really nice to let us come in and do um, data collection at their site instead. But that's kind of what we've been getting from principals. A lot of static, a lot of static from principals. Um, and at first, some of it was they were concerned about um, whether we were going to be like too intrusive into um, folks' lives. And I mean, I understand that. I, I, but um, yeah, sometimes it was just weird like that just felt sort of <laughs> passive aggressive um yeah um trying to think of uh anyone else's other questions um david this is um Samika. i have a question um is there a reporting requirement from from the schools um for them being a meal site um, could you uh, explain what you mean a little bit more, please? Um, so if this is a, if these are funded, if this is a funded grant, I'm assuming they're receiving to get the, the free school meals for the families. Is there a reporting requirement from the schools? Oh, in terms of the number of meals that they serve? Correct. Uh, yes, there is, but that won't be um, publicly available until later. I want to say at the earliest, probably October. Is there, and the reason why I was asking was if, if there was a way for you to embed yourself in that re required reporting component um, so that you can get the data that you need, uh, that probably will help. Um, I know we have a program that's funded by a federal grant um, and reporting requirements are required for you know instructors um, and advisors that we hire. So, you know, if, if they're not, you know, open to giving you the information that you need for them to continue getting um, or being a food site, um, embedding yourself in that process to make it a requirement could help with your data collection, because it seems like the data collection is needed for them to continue getting um, the funding for the programs. So um, the F uh, summer meal sites don't get their money via grants. Um, it comes via um, the Food and Nutrition Service, and it's based off of, I don't remember the name of the law right now, but basically um, if it's a certain percentage of the population is um, eligible for free and reduced school meals, then um, there is a summer meal site that is set up that is paid for through um, the summer meal um, food program, which is a element of FNS the same way that the national school lunch program is. And so it's not, and the other thing is that that data isn't actually very well, um, well, for example, FNS does not disaggregate data beyond state. Uh -huh. So um, they wouldn't be able to tell us if, how, anything other than here's how much money we paid to Maryland. We would, they wouldn't even be able to tell you for, for PG, certainly not to a particular school. And then they wouldn't know necessarily the breakdown of um, parents of what their food security is or what their um, uh, sociodemographic uh, characteristics were. So um, we might learn a little bit, but we wouldn't necessarily have the um, breadth and depth of data that we're hoping to get out of this. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask, um, this is Bridget Warren, can I ask whether you, um, and I may have missed this earlier, so I apologize, did you work with someone in um, the main office to get permission that then sent out a message to the schools you're interested in, or did you contact schools individually? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we have IRB approval 
from both PGCPS and uh, Johns Hopkins in order to conduct the study, but we needed to get individual um, approval for each school from the principal. Right, I understand, but was there a message sent to the relevant school principals? Yes. yes. Okay, and do you have a copy of that message? Yes, um, if you'd like, um, we can- No, that's share. okay. I'm just, I, I worked with the county and, and the schools. We were doing Title I only schools uh, for the USDA farmers to families distribution. And some schools had a lot of hesitation. They wanted the food for their residents, but we had to come up with workarounds at a number of schools. Uh, the principal position was vacant and the assistant principal wasn't sure he could do it officially, but he decided to do it on the side, unofficially, because he couldn't get a response. Um, and he even showed up when it was holiday breaks to make sure the kids got their food. So depending on the school and the personality that's involved, and each school has their own culture, you know, you may call at the end of the school year and you're going to get a school year employee who says, okay, this is great, but they're not a year-round employee. So any okay may get lost. So I was just wondering whether there was a way we could smooth the road for you with the schools that aren't responsive by providing that information. So if you have an advocate who can write an into a PGCPS advocate who can write a note to the principals you're having trouble reaching, that might be helpful. Yeah, and I'm a former PGCPS uh, teacher. I taught at Dr. Henry Wise High School for um, four years. And um, I was reaching out to members to um, members of PGCEA and all of that. And yeah, the, really wasn't going very well. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're hoping that you all might be able to um, help with uh, outreach, especially for the um, back to school events. Definitely. I'm happy to, to share any um, any flyers. I know Heaven is great with getting getting the word out through our networks. Um, so that's that's definitely something we can do. Um, if anyone is interested in, in participating or helping support in any of the other ways, um, please feel free to reach out to us or, or to David and we can um, connect either way. Um, and we'll be sure to kind of pull out that list you shared on the slide and send it out via the notes um, so folks can can take a look at that again. Uh, but I think there are lots of ways that we can collaborate a little bit more moving forward. Um, the Food Equity Council has also hired a consultant who's going to be doing some more in-depth research on school meal engagement in Prince George's County as a whole. Um, she's currently um, on, on leave, but we'll be kind of jumping back into this research a little bit more this fall um, and in the spring um, school year. So we'll, we'll definitely be presenting more information on that in the coming months. Um, and I'm sure there, there are lots of overlap and opportunities to, to collaborate um, with this team. So David and Dorbor, I really appreciate you sharing this information um, and thanks for sharing your contact information. So if anyone has any other ideas or, or opportunities to get involved, um, please feel free to reach out to them. So with that, I wanna keep on moving since I know we have a few other folks on the agenda. So thank you again. Um, and we are going to move on to Samia Bingham and Evelyn Batista, who are our guests from Flavors, who are going to be sharing some work that they've been working on um, with Flavors, which is a commercial kitchen and, and workspace incubator. Um, so they have a really exciting project to share. Um, so we wanted to give you all a, a taste of that. Heaven and I and some other FEC members had um, the pleasure of, of already getting a little bit of a sneak peek, but I'm excited to, to learn more about what they've worked on since then. Um, so Samia and Evelyn, off to you. All right. Um, and then we also have Tristan Nichols. He's actually our operations manager for the commercial kitchen. He's on as well. Um, so um, again, my name is Samia Bingham. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Flavors Culinary Hub, um, commercial incubator, shared kitchen. We go by a few different names. Um, we are located located in Hyattsville, Maryland, um, right next to um, Prince George's Plaza Mall, um, Carolina Kitchen, the movie theater. We're in that University Town Center shopping center. Um, so um, 
We offer three services through Flavors, um, first being the commercial kitchen space. Um, Tristan Nichols leads um, that operation. Um, so he's actually at the kitchen. You'll see the background behind him. So he's at the commercial kitchen. Um, we currently serve about 35 food, beverage, and agriculture-based businesses. Um, they are officially licensed to our culinary hub. They come into the commercial kitchen to prep, cater, um, host private events in our private dining room brunch events, anything that's related to growing and scaling their food, beverage, and agriculture business. Uh, we are an FDA certified kitchen. We have our first um, CPG beverage manufacturer, um, a tea called Grandma G's, created by Health Neurotics. Um, so we are FDA certified based on that particular company operating out of our facility. Um, during uh, the operations, up to two companies can operate out of our kitchen at any given time. We are 100% member-based, so companies become a member of Flavors in order to access our facility and our other business development resources that we offer. Um, Tristan, am I missing anything as far as the kitchen is concerned? Um, no, but um, we have a virtual community as well. So the virtual community um, kind of leads into what Evelyn Batista is now leading under our USDA grant. So um, if you are just getting started um, with your food or beverage or agriculture business, um, and we focus on the business side, you know, we leave the food to the experts. We are, you know, the experts on the business side. So my background is federal government contracts, um, contract specialist with DOD and commercial real estate. That's where I come from. Tristan is a chef. Um, and so he kind of leads on the food side. Uh, we leave that magic to Tristan because you don't want Samia in the kitchen. <laughs> um, and so with the virtual community, if a company is not quite ready to get into the kitchen, they can join as a virtual member and we'll work with them on a monthly basis for business development. Um, the blessing in all of this is that we were awarded a $500,000 grant last October from USDA for the Local Food Promotion Program um, grant LFPP, um, and that grant is now building our entire education platform, which is called Magnolia University. Uh, we'll be launching in just a few weeks. I was hoping to have more of the website available, um, Julia, but you know they're working hard. The tech team is working two, three o'clock in the morning trying to get this thing working. Um, but the platform will actually um, host our entire uh, first program. It's a nine-week program that starts on September 11th through November 6th. Um, this program is for food, beverage, and agriculture businesses that are at least bringing in about $50,000 in annual revenue. Um, and they will go through a nine-week hybrid program, both virtual and on-site, uh, with a few field trips. Um, so we have uh, classes such as human resources, corporate contracts and event planning, accounting, operations and systems, commercial retail space, finance, um, consumer packaged good branding, uh, government, federal government contracts. Uh, we have food hall operations, uh, food costing and purchasing, and a few field trips that includes um, private backdoor tour of the new Ruby's location in Bowie, Maryland. Um, so we'll get some behind the scenes there. Um, we will also be doing a mock-up event at the Sandlot in DC, where the participants will put together um, in groups, they'll be in groups of five, um, they'll put together a, um, an event, a, a faux event at the Sandlot in DC, and they'll present that to um, the instructor. Um, we've hired instructors around the DMV, um, also just around the U.S. Uh, we have um, Slutty Vegan Operations Director is handling our event planning. Uh, we have uh, Mudge, which is out of um, L.A. They're a great uh, corporate uh, branding, consumer packaged good branding company. Uh, we have Chef Ponder, who's a celebrity chef out of Atlanta. He's leading as the lead instructor and in food costs. Um, and purchasing class. So uh, we have a pretty robust program that's coming up um, and we welcome any food, beverage or agriculture based business um, that is looking to scale and grow um, their business on the business side, on the business side. Um, there's no, there are no food classes um, as a part of this particular program. Uh, we may in the future, as Magnolia University grows, we may offer culinary classes. Um, we do have a mini four week cohort 
um, that is scheduled to start in the winter. And that is specifically for agriculture businesses, farmers, local growers, um, and they will actually be on site with a chef to create value added products. So we're actually looking for um, an instructor to lead the development of a value add product. So if anyone knows of a chef um, or someone that has uh, experience in that space, we are looking to hire someone uh, for that uh, for that particular mini four week cohort. Um, so Evelyn Batista is our program assistant who is leading the Magnolia University nine week program. Um, and so if anyone needs any additional information um, and maybe the next call, we'll have the platform to show you some, some more sneak peeks. Um, we'll definitely share that with you at the next meeting. Um, but if you have any, if, uh, any questions, you can reach us at education at what's your flavor.co and that is .co and not .com. Um, and you can also find us on our website, Instagram at what's your flavor.co on all channels, IG, um, Facebook, and our website, what's your flavor.co. Um, so thank you all so much for the opportunity to share. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Samia. This is just such an incredible resource and the work you do um, is, is really incredible. So thanks for sharing that. I did see a question from Rosalind. Um, can you talk a little bit about the membership fees to, to be a part of this? Sure, Tristan, can you talk about membership fees for our emerging uh, members? Yes. yes, I can, I can take that over. So your virtual community is $199 a month. Your emerging 10, so emerging to us means 10 hours, that's $600 a month. And we have an emerging 20, that's 20 hours a month, that's for $900. And we have an emerging 40, that's $1,500 a month. Again, that's 40 hours. And we have an emerging 80, that's twenty one hundred dollars a month. That's eighty hours. And so, for the emerging memberships, um, the hours correlate to you get these hours to use in the kitchen. We are twenty four hours a day. You do have a door code, so you can get in day or night to access the, the facility. Um, we have a parking garage. Uh, we are in a mixed use retail center. Um, and so we are kind of closer to a parking garage. So you have on site parking. We have a loading dock. Um, you can get your deliveries there. Uh, we also just won a new grant called the Keep It Cool grant. I'm sure some of you may have heard about that one. Uh, we just got awarded that one um, a few weeks ago. That was $35,000. And that is now to bring in individual refrigerators, lockable refrigerators and freezers so that our members can actually um, have some long-term storage. Um, all of our members use fresh products, so we won't need many of the freezers except for some of our new ice cream members um, that are starting. So that was a great conversation earlier, great lead into this conversation. Um, and so we'll have the refrigeration um, on site within the next 60 to 90 days, we're gonna knock a wall out and kind of combine the current refrigeration that we have so that it's it's all together and it makes sense along with the dry storage. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you both. Um, and that's super exciting about the Keeping It Cool grant. I feel like those, those grants are kind of percolating throughout our, our region and, and throughout the county. And it's really exciting to hear about um, all of the, the recipients of that. Any other questions um, for Samia or Tristan? Okay, well, we're clearly gonna have to have you guys back um, sometime soon when that platform is up and running. Um, so always happy to, to have you join um, a future FEC meeting. Um, so yeah, I would say stay tuned um, and and yeah, we'll, we'll keep tabs on, on what you're working on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna move on um, to the rest of our agenda. Let me just pull this up. Um, so before, before we jump into our general kind of FEC committee updates, um, I did, we did wanna have a conversation about FEC's upcoming 10 year anniversary. Um, and so this is something that we talked about a while ago, and it's been on our mind for, for a little bit, but overall, our 10 years as the FEC will be coming up this fall, um, so in the next few months, um, and we would love to figure out a way to celebrate this milestone. So we will be putting together a smaller FEC committee that will be focused on planning something, um, and that something 
needs to be decided. So we were hoping that we could have just a little bit of an informal conversation to see if anyone has any initial ideas of, of what that could look like. Um, I know we do have a lot of new people, but we also have a lot of old time founding FEC members. So I just wanted to briefly open this up to see if, if this is possible to have a conversation about this. Um, if folks are a little bit stumped or want to mull that over, we will be following up later with a, a, a when to meet um, to put together that first committee meeting probably in the next like couple of weeks um, to do some more brainstorming about what this um, what this event could look like. Um, the the event, this 10 year anniversary could be something big, it could be something small, um, but we really just want to figure out some way of acknowledging this um, this milestone. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and just see if anyone wants to take themselves off mute, chime in on the chat of kind of what this what this could look like. Hey, Julia. Hey, Kim. Um, I wanted to mention that our very first meeting was at Eco City Farms um, at their I think it was at their Edmonston location. Um, yeah, because I think Bladensburg was just coming online. So just mentioning that in case, you know, you wanted to do something in conjunction with them. Yep, I think that's a great idea and something we floated a little bit. Um, so maybe doing another event there, um, you know, we could just have a regular FEC meeting where we gathered eco, we could do something bigger, hosting a fundraiser, hosting a dinner. I don't know. These are just, these are, you know, off the wall ideas. Um, but I think it would be really nice to, to involve eco in, in some way. Any other ideas? Community day, see in the chat, like a carnival or a fundraising dinner. Love that. Is there an actual month that the anniversary falls in for the 10th anniversary? I want to say November, but that might be wrong. Kim or any of our original FEC members, do you have a, a month? October. Oh, October. Awesome. October. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things you think about when not in the month of October. In October 1st, you can kind of maybe combine a few things, harvest um outdoorsy events before it gets too cold um in terms of the location but maybe combining some of those themes with the 10th year anniversary pumpkins i don't know i don't know how late how late it, can you plant seeds for pumpkins does anybody know <laughs> you know right around the fall time you get you know your pumpkin lattes and all of that you know everything is pumpkin spice flavored can we plant pumpkin seeds anywhere i don't know like that might might be a little late, but we could maybe harvest some pumpkins. How about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm seeing happy hour in the garden. I think that's a great idea. I'm not sure if this is showing up as as me on your end, but I didn't write that and then comment on my chat. Um, our Zoom function is a little bit wonky, so I think that was Heaven's idea. Um, ice cream social back to our our icebreaker. That could also be fun. Um, jazz in the garden. And someone said something about October, and we may have done it around food day. I can't remember the launch of the FEC. That could be right. That's ringing a bell. Any other That's food day at Bowie, the, like the food day that was at Bowie State this past year? Yeah, and, and FEC has done a few different kind of like combined events um, with Bowie State um, for Food Day. And I don't remember if it was, I know there were some other ones. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was also the, the launch event, but that could be right, Kim. Taste of PG County as a fundraiser. That's a good idea. Anyone else? So I guess kind of a, a prodding question, would folks like to do something 
kind of in person where we get together, whether it's jazz in the garden or an ice cream social or planting pumpkins or a happy hour. You can give me maybe a thumbs up if an in-person event sounds sounds fun to you. I think some nods. Okay. So I think that's that's likely what this will be. Um, and we'll we'll try to figure out what that would look like. Um, as you all know, we are a little bit tight on staff capacity right now. Um, so we would love your help organizing this. Um, so we will be putting together a smaller meeting to talk about this a little bit more and come up with a final idea. Um, and if anyone is interested in joining that, please do keep your eyes out um, on the FEC listserv. Um, so we'll hopefully be able to put together a meeting relatively quickly um, and then move forward with, with planning because October will be here before we know it. Um, I know our October, our next FEC meeting is also in October. So potentially it could be a combined FEC meeting slash happy hour. We'll we'll figure that out down the line. Anybody, um, sorry for chiming, anybody make t-shirts? I mean, I'm happy to support a t-shirt to honor the 10th anniversary if anybody can create the design and maybe it can be orange or something that, or I don't know to just kind of like put a, a um, make it pop, you know? I love that idea. Yeah, I love that. I know we've had some other FEC members in the past float float t-shirts, the t-shirt idea. Um, I remember we talked about maybe seeing if we could bring on like a local artist or something to design something. So if anyone, if we have any artists here or if you know of any local artists um, that might be interested in working on something like that, um, please do pass that information along. Um, but I would love to put together a, a t-shirt. I think it's been a long time coming. We haven't had any FEC swag. So um, so I think we need some FEC swag. <laughs> I'm also, I'm happy to ask some of the students, if you see in my background that well, some of the students will, they do their own creation for climate crisis. And um, we just try to promote some of them. Um, you know, I don't get anything for promoting them. It's just, you know, just the awareness around climate crisis. But I'm um, happy to ask, you know, that person that works with those students, if they can come up with a theme, if maybe you can just bullet some key things you want to emphasize for the 10th year anniversary. And this is not solely one idea, but, you know, in collaboration with others that might be artists represented amongst us today. Uh, and then you can kind of flush out, you know, and see which one people want to go with. That sounds great. I'm seeing, uh, hearing and seeing a lot of great ideas. Um, so if anyone has a local artist that you recommend, um, please do connect us. Um, so I've just dropped my email, Heaven's email in the chat. Um, please connect us via email and then we can we can reach out um, and see if, if they might be interested in working with us um, because I think that would be that would be really exciting. Um, so, yeah, great ideas. Anyone else? Okay, I feel inspired, ready to move forward with this. Um, so I know Heaven from my team, Scarlett from my team. We're all going to be kind of putting our heads together, um, figuring out next steps to put together this smaller um, committee meeting to move forward with playing this event. So things will be in the works. Again, you are all invited to participate in this planning process. We would really love your help um, in addition to any connections with, with artists um, or different spaces or, or um, locations to, to host this. Um, so please do feel free to reach out if any other ideas come to you, even if you can't participate in the committee meeting, um, feel free to shoot us an email. Okay, well, I appreciate you all indulging us in this. More to come. Um, and with that, I'm going to jump over to our committee updates um, from our FEC members. Um, I know, I don't think we have all of our committee leaders on the call today. So I think I might just kind of let this be a little bit of a free for all. So any of our FEC committee leaders, if you are here and have updates to share on your committee, um, please, please jump in. Um, and I'm just going to let whoever wants to go first, go first. 
I can jump in. Um, so I, I will actually speak for like a good majority of the committees actually. <laughs> um, so I'll first talk about the farmer's market support committee. So we haven't had a meeting since March, but we are scheduling a meeting for August just to check in, see how the markets are doing in Prince George's County, see if anyone needs any support. Um, and also to share the outreach materials that have been developed since our last meeting. So we have some flyers um, and some, uh, we have physical flyers and digital flyers that anyone can share within your network. We're trying to get it out as much as possible. Um, we've sent them to all of the council members and they've included it in some of their newsletters and the county executive office. So that's pretty cool. So hopefully more people will be visiting the farmer's market um, this season because they're aware of the times um, and days of the markets. Um, and also, if you want to uh, share out any of those resources, um, I've uh, linked them in the resources uh, part of the agenda below. And I, we also have um, some paper flyers. So if you are, want, are at the library or something or the community center um, and you want to distribute those flyers, I'm happy to ship those to you so that you can have them on hand or even if you for your, your job or organization, but happy to send those to you all. Um, and then I'll also touch base on the Food Rescue Committee. Uh, we had a meeting uh, last month, I believe, um, for folks who are interested in um, recruiting new donors. Um, and I'm also talking to like a kind of informal, informal group um, in Greenbelt tomorrow. Um, so more to come there, um, just kind of ramping up and getting folks excited about food rescue and um, talking to local business owners in their community about getting on board with food rescue. And then I don't think Chloe is on, I think she had to go, but I will also touch base about the food in jail sh should heal not harm committee. Um, so this is a, it's been a very active committee um, and we are actually planning, well, we have planned um, a community conversation for this Saturday, July 29th um, from one to three. It's also linked in the resources and announcement section. Um, and it's, anyone can come. It's just a conversation about food in jails to get folks aware of the current state of food in jails um, and also um, get folks excited about potentially um, getting some policy, uh, a, a bill passed in the coming uh, legislative sessions. Um, and then we also have a virtual one um, community conversation on August 30th. Um, from six to seven. So, and I've included the res registration link in the resources and announcement section. So anyone can join. You're more than welcome to attend. If you are interested in getting involved in any of these committees, feel free to email me and I'm happy to connect you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Lots of great work happening with those committees. Any other committee leaders want to jump in? I'll jump in for food is medicine. Um, hi, everyone. So food is medicine committee. We have a program, Prince George is Fresh. I was going to say food is medicine again, sorry. But um, with that program, we currently, we're in the wrapping up, we're wrapping up our pilot phase. We currently have six participants left. So working through, their, the participants are in the program for six months at a time. So we're working through that. And also I know the IPHI team on the back end, they're working on analyzing the data so far and putting that together into a report. Also doing feedback from participants and past participants of how we can improve the program. We're looking for funding to start the new phase. And um, so we're in the throes of that right now. Julia, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I think that was comprehensive. We're a little bit in a wait and see moment with, with Prince George's Fresh, um, which has shown some really, really promising preliminary results from the pilot. Um, and so because of that, we're really excited and 
optimistic that we can move this forward into kind of a 2.0 phase. So hopefully, hopefully that will kind of pan out this fall. Um, but yeah, more, hopefully more to come. Yes. And I'll add leap from that work. Um, we're about to start some policy work, policy research with the rest um other programs or initiatives around the state to see um for Maryland's CMS 1115 Medicaid waiver for Medicaid to cover medically tailored meals. So um, participants or people who are in need of medically tailored meals, it will be covered through their insurance if they have Medicaid. Thanks, Ren. Jill, I can drop a link in the chat. Um, and while I'm doing that, maybe I'll we'll pass it to Kim for updates if you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll present on behalf of my co-chair, Liz Robinson, and the members of the Urban Farm Support Committee. Um, so we're still at a sort of at a standstill right now with the Urban Ag Property Tax Credit. I know um, Harrison's on the call. I think he's um, waiting to hear a little bit more from um, Delegate Layman's office. Um, and so once we have from, some more information there, we'll have some other updates. Um, the other thing that we've been working on, I don't know if Megan Todd is still on from the Ag Law Education Initiative, um, but she arranged for one of, oh, she had three interns this year, and one of them was primarily dedicated to um, our project, um, although the others, I think, you know, helped co contribute as well. Um, but they started developing um, a sort of a permitting matrix for urban ag um, and also, you know, traditional ag um, regarding structures. So uh, they gave us a draft uh, guidance document that we're our committee is going to provide um, some feedback on. Um, and this is something we're hoping to put on FEC's uh, website, obviously with disclaim uh, disclaimers about, you know, making sure you check with, you know, Department of Permitting Inspections and Enforcement and also, you know, the planning department um, before proceeding. And, you know, this isn't the end all and be all, but just to give folks a little bit of guidance in terms of what to expect um, if they're thinking about putting up a high tunnel system um, or a shed or a pergola, you know, some of these other accessory structures. Um, so that was what our uh, most recent meeting was. So again, special thanks to Megan Todd. I don't know if she's on here, if she wants to, you know, say anything further. Um, but her interns gave a great presentation uh, last Friday, and I believe it was recorded. Um, so if folks are in interested in that, just let me know. Um, let's see, the only other thing, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat box, just some links we had in our agenda meeting. Um, once earlier, I think I mentioned that one of our chefs who actually works for Food and Friends with Casey, um, Chef uh, Rashid Abdurman, he was in the governor's by local kickout. So there is a press release that I'll drop in the chat box. His picture is featured in the press release with the governor and the secretary of agriculture. Um, and also, I don't know if folks have heard, but um, vegetable and butcher is relocating to Upper Marlboro. So that'll be exciting in terms of, you know, me, uh, meal preparation for folks. So I'll drop those in the chat. Um, and I, Mara, I see your um, note in the chat. So I will try to get something to you. I have, I'm not sure if they sent the recording yet, but as soon as they do, I'll share. And if anyone is interested in providing feedback on that um, matrix that's not on the Urban Farm Committee, you know, please let us know. And that's it for me. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, and then I'll just briefly share, um, we also have a food assistance provider um, support group committee um, that hasn't really met a too much um, in the past few months, um, but it is a small group that kind of supports um, some of the work that we do to support food assistance providers in the county and food pantries. Um, we do a few different things, but one of the things we main things we do is host a monthly call series um, for food assistance providers and food pantries. Um, so that's been an ongoing um, project, um, and it's really an opportunity to just bring together food assistance providers every month to share updates and resources and, and have different presentations. Kind of similar to what we do with Food Equity Council, but for a, a smaller kind of subset of folks specifically in the food assistance space. Um, but anyone is always welcome to join those meetings if you're ever interested in, in getting more involved in that um, or any of the other kind of projects or, or work we do to support food assistance providers, um, feel free to let me know. Um, and then one thing that kind of is a subsection, I guess, of that, of that committee 
Um, we got funding from Washington Gas this year to purchase two new cold storage trailers. Um, and so we hosted a kind of ribbon cutting event, launch event um, at the end of June to celebrate the kind of unveiling of those two trailers. Um, and so it was an exciting opportunity to, to bring everyone together um, and to celebrate those two new trailers that are beautiful. Um, if folks haven't seen the photos, um, they were painted with a very talented artist, um, Whitney Frazier. Um, she designed a full kind of wrap um, around the trailers um, with beautiful designs. Um, I think Kevin just dropped, yes, dropped the photos in the chat. Um, so please do take a look at those trailers. Um, so they're cold storage trailers that are posted at Kingdom Global and Tabernacle in Laurel. Um, Kingdom Global is in Calverton. Um, and they're really an amazing opportunity to increase cold storage um, for food assistance providers to help them kind of store and distribute more food um, to, to serve their clients. Um, so we're really excited that we had this opportunity to, to work on that project. Um, okay, I think that's everything on my end. If folks are interested in learning anything else about our committees in general, always feel free to reach out to myself, to Heaven, to any of our committee leaders. If you don't have folks' contact information, um, email any of, any of us, um, email the info at FEC, PGC FEC account. Um, and we can connect you um, to any of those committee leaders. Um, we encourage all of our members to participate in a committee. Um, if there is a topic or an area that you're really interested in working on that there isn't a committee for, um, let us know. Maybe we can start a new committee. It's, you know, we, we always like to kind of keep these a little bit flexible. Committees are always starting and sunsetting. So please do reach out if there's something that you're passionate about and, and want to work on and we'd love to find ways to kind of plug you in to, to the work that we do. Um, okay, I, I think that's everything from the committee side of things. Any questions before we kind of move on to wrapping up our FEC meeting? Okay, well, our um, next FEC meeting is scheduled for October 24th. Um, you should all have a calendar invite. I think Heaven updated the, the link in the calendar invite since that was wrong. Um, we will be in touch about what we're going to do with that meeting. Potentially, we might scrap that and instead do this FEC anniversary um, event in, in lieu of an FE, a virtual meeting. Um, we will be sure to keep you guys posted. We'll send out lots of updates and information via the FEC listserv. So please make sure to keep your eyes out on that. If you are not signed up on the FEC listserv, um, feel free to reach out to me or just drop your info in the chat now and we can be sure to add you um, so you know kind of what's coming up um, for, for that. Um, and then Heaven put together a wealth of resources at the end of our FEC agenda. So please do take a look at any of those um, if, if you want to learn more. Um, Heaven, anything you want to say about those resources or anything else before we close out? Yeah, it's just a compilation of things that are in the Google group and also some outreach materials. And I, I was looking through a lot of folks' applications and I saw uh, that a lot of folks wanted to help out with outreach. So yeah, this is a great start to help out with outreach. So the farmer's market listing, uh, the food assistance resources, if you know any of anyone that's in need or any organizations that are serve folks that are in need, um, feel free to share um, any of those with our uh, with your community. And then I also just wanted to highlight Buy Local Challenge and Buy Local Week, which is this week. Week, and there is an event um, on the 31st if you're interested in participating and then some information on summer meal sites um, and uh, some articles about uh, the healthy restaurants bill. So just take a, a look. Thanks, Heaven. And Kim just dropped a link in the chat as well um, for um, the Maryland Department of Agriculture, which is seeking input um, on resilience food systems infrastructure program. Um, so you can chime in there um, with your input. Um, and with that, I would just open it up to any other resources, events, links, anything you wanna share before we, we close out. This is our open-ended portion, open -ended portion of the meeting.
and maybe everyone is just itching to get outside and go buy some ice cream. Okay. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, please keep your eyes out on our FEC listserv. Um, we will be sending a, a meeting invite or when to meet for this FEC anniversary um, committee that we're gonna be putting together. Um, we always send out lots of resources. Heaven does a fantastic job keeping you all informed about what's going on in the county and the region. Um, and we, again, really appreciate you all being here, um, taking the time to learn about all of these different happenings. Again, feel free to reach out if you are not on an FEC committee and you would like to join one, we'd love to get you involved. Um, and with that, we'll close it out with 30 minutes to spare. So hope you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon and your evening. Um, and we look forward to being in touch um, and seeing you all in October. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Okay. Bye.